So hello, uh, welcome back to CSD 3205. Um, in this lecture, we're going to be covering Spring. So Spring frameworks, uh, the sort of core usage of Spring is uh, to connect together all of the components uh, in an application. So you can sort of write your application using, you know, hundreds of these sort of modular classes called Java Beans, and then Spring will connect them together in appropriate ways um, so that they, their dependencies between them is kind of automatically managed by Spring. And in this lecture, that's the core Spring functionality I'm going to fun focus on. But Spring has, you know, around 20 other kind of projects or modules, as it's called, um, which also might be useful to you, right? And you're very welcome to use these in your coursework. So, you know, if you want to use the Spring database stuff instead of the Hibernate data stuff, database stuff, then, that, you know, then that's okay. But maybe have a conversation with me first about that. So as usual in this course, I have a little flick through the kind of Java jobs that are available. And, you know, we've got 28 pages if we search for Spring and Java on Techno Jobs, which is pretty good going, right? And a lot of them are sort of a part of this sort of ecosystem of sort of Spring and Hibernate. That's like a classic combination in terms of Enterprise Java, using sort of Spring to connect everything together and Hibernate um, to actually do the object relational mapping, which we're going to cover in the next lecture. So, you know, here we look, senior Java, Java, Java developer, blah, 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 Spring, REST, SQL, you know, basically the sort of stuff that I'm covering in this, kind of, in this course. So this lecture, I'm going to start by giving you an introduction to Java Beans, um, which is the sort of uh, the modular components that are put together by Spring. Then I'm going to explain what's meant by dependency injection, which is a way in which you uh, put one class inside another class um, that depends on that class. Then I'm going to show you how Spring is used to manage uh, the dependencies between classes. Um, and then show you how you can build Spring projects with Maven. Okay, so Java Beans. So, as I sort of briefly touched on already, one of the core uses of Spring is to connect different classes together. And the classes that are wired together by Spring um, are referred to as Beans. So this kind of Bean thing um, is kind of common um, in many areas of enterprise Java. So when I was doing Java messaging service, for example, you know, you had to create these beans and then you had the dependency management handles, you know, you had to sort of inject uh, classes that were managed on the server into these beans. Um, and, you know, no doubt there were, and you know, I think maybe Hibernate, not sure if Hibernate is bean based, but uh, certainly in some areas of Java, in enterprise Java, you know, you're going to come across beans again. So it's good to get a little clear on what beans are. And you can think of a bean like a kind of coffee bean, right? That's sort of playing on this, there's a double play here, right? Because you've got Java, which is a type of coffee, which is like the bean. Um, but also, you know, you've got this uh, slightly corny spring beans kind of thing, right? Which is like the, you know, the green jobs, yeah? Okay. So Java bean um, is a modular piece of code. That's the core thing about it. It's a single sort of encapsulated blob of code wrapped up in you know, a class, basically. Um, that's easy to test and reuse. So you've just got this sort of isolated bit of code that does something useful to you. Yeah? And the sort of three key properties of a Java, Java bean is that it's serializable, has a zero argument constructor, and has getter and setter methods for its private variables. All the private variables that matter and possibly all of the private variables. So by serializable, um, it means that uh, the Java bean implements the serializable interface. And this is to support the functionality in Java where you can take a Java class with its in a particular state, right? The variables are all in a particular state. And then you can convert that class into bytes and store those bytes on a disk, or you can pass those bytes over a network. And then what, the, what you can do is then read back those bytes and then reconstruct that class in the state it was in when you, when you saved it, when you converted it to bytes. That's sort of the sort of aim of this serializable thing. And when you're creating a serializable class, you implement the serializable interface, and you also have to make sure that all of the variables in the class are also serializable. Or if they're not, you mark them as transient, which means that they can't be incorporated into the, ca the class state that's persisted on disk or passed across the network. So that's what serializable is. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, or any detail really, um, because you don't need it for wiring up Spring Beans. So for Spring, it doesn't really care, matter if it's serializable, but if you want a proper Java bean, you know, and people are going to say, hey, that's a good bean, um, then it needs to be serializable. So here's my little example of a Java bean. So we've got this class person, which is like representing a person in the world here. And it's implementing this serializable interface because this is a full proper bean, so to speak. This uh, Java bean has a zero argument constructor. So as you'll see with Spring, you know, the way it works is it'll sort of create instances of all the classes it needs to get to, to connect together. It will then set 
all of the properties in the class appropriately, and then it'll sort of wire them all together. So in order to create an instance of the class, uh, it needs a zero argument constructor, so it always knows how, how to basically create an instance of the class without knowing the arguments of a sort of non-zero argument constructor. And then we've got getters and setters. Here we've got getters and setters for all of the private variables here. So you might think, oh, maybe just make these public, um, but, you know, I'm no expert on design patterns, but I'm pretty sure that's a bad idea. So, you know, it's better that we have these private and have the getters and setters so we can explicitly, you know, get these the values of these variables and explicitly set them as well. So this is all part of the picture, right, where we're getting it to kind of boot up the application. And to do that, it needs to create instances of the class with zero argument constructor, and it needs to be able to set um, the values of the variables appropriately um, as part of this booting up process. Yeah. So as I said, the classes that you're wiring together with Spring don't need to implement the serializable interface, um, but you do need, for sure, the empty argument constructor and the getter and setter methods. Uh, you know, I mean, possibly with the annotation thing, you could get away without an empty argument constructor, but it's better to stick to that as a, as a guiding principle. So I've explained what uh, beans are, and now we're going to look at how the beans are connected together. And that's what's called a process of a dependency injection. So this is the core feature of the Spring framework. You know, I was working at Trinity Mirror, you know, this is what we were using uh, Spring for. Um, and, you know, this is what I used it for as well. Um, I wrote my own uh, kind of uh, sort of agent system for generating music. And again, I used Spring for that um, because it made it easier, but that, I didn't use any of the fancy stuff in Spring. I just used it for the dependency injection. And the motivation behind dependency injection is that we might have very large Java applications with lots and lots of classes. I mean, you know, applications I've written, I don't know, uh, 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50 classes, right? A lot of classes, right? And you've got to put them together in a systematic way, yeah? And if you're talking an enterprise level application, uh, you know, that runs across, you know, thousands of servers or whatever, you know, it could have thousands of classes, right? So you can have lots and lots of classes and very complex dependencies between these classes. Um, so, we, but, and we also want, as part of our sort of a way of building these kind of big applications, we want each class to be as independent and modular as possible, yeah? We want to be able to write nice unit tests for each of those classes and without, you know, with as little as possible of complex stuff of injecting mock objects, or if we're injecting mock objects, that's fine, but we can also do that with Spring, by the way. So, how's the unit testing? Obviously, you know, if we're hooking together, let's say a thousand classes, just for an example, um, we don't want to write, have to write, you know, thousands of lines of rather dodgy code that somehow, you know, inject, connect them together. So this is the sort of the thinking behind Spring and Enterprise Java is let's build these small beans with uh, as small and simple as possible, as modular as possible, and then we'll connect them together to build the big, bigger functionality that we want. And that's what dependency injection is used for, yeah? That's the dependency injection is the wiring that connects these modular components together. So, uh, why do we need dependency injection? Well, if we had a bunch of, if we had a thousand classes that were completely independent of each other, then we wouldn't need to connect them between. We wouldn't need to create connections between them, right? Suppose we just had a simple, you know, plain old Java or Pojo class that had like a string variable and an integer variable, right? We wouldn't need to, there's no dependencies between that class and some other class that's also got a string and an integer variable. They're just completely isolated classes. But if we want more want complex functionality, right? We're going to need to connect classes together into a bigger system. And this happens typically when we've got variables within the Java bean that are themselves classes. So we've got one Java bean inside another Java bean, effectively. So in other words, the Java bean is dependent on another class. And so dependency injection is when we use setter methods. So I told you I had these getter and setters for each of the each Java bean, right? We can use these setter beans, setter methods, to set the dependencies in these classes. And so the, how it's described is we use setter methods to inject dependencies into the Java bean. That's what we're doing here. So it's sort of injecting, like imagine the syringe and you've got the one class inside the syringe and you inject that uh, class into the other class, yeah? And that's kind of what it's like, yeah? So here's a little example, so let's just see, yeah? So here we've got a, the person class that I discussed, right? So it's, this is a Java bean, right, with the getters and setters here. And then what we have, just for example, we've got this car class, right? And so the car class, just, it's, you know, just to tell you, it's just, just, I just stuck the thread in there, just to sort of help reinforce, you know, all the stuff I've been teaching about threads. So we've got the car class, uh, which is a kind of thread, and it's got a, let's see what I've got in here, yep. 
So we've got a bunch of variables here. It's like got a, so these are simple variables, right? Like a color and a manufacturer, right? And then we also have um, another class, a person, um, which is a variable within our car class, yeah? And then we've got the empty zero argument constructor here. And then just to make it a little bit exciting example, I've got a, some thread functionality in this car class. So it's got a method drive, and that starts the thread running. And the run method just sort of sits there, you know, increasing the distance and sleeping and increasing distance and logging the output. Yeah, it's not a terribly exciting car, um, but it's just to give you the idea, yeah? And then we got the uh, accessor methods, the getters and setters. Um, so, and one of these getters and setters um, will enable us to set and get the person here. So we can access this variable here, but even though it's private, we've got a getter and setter for it. And that will enable us um, to call set owner, which will enable us to create a person class and inject that person class into the car class. That's the dependency injection, you know, thing. We, that's, that's what dependency injection is, yeah? Now we can do this manually, right? Um, we could create a new car, create a new person, we could set up the person with appropriate variables here, we, and then we could inject the person class into the car class. That's all dependency injection is. It's sort of a slightly fancy term, term makes sense, but it's not actually not that complicated, yeah? And once we've, if we didn't have this step, if we skipped the car set owner stuff, and we called car drive, we'd end up with a null pointer exception, yeah? Because uh, when we get to drive, on, uh, So a little bit of noise outside there. Um, so if we set up, um, if we started the car driving and we call this run method, um, then we're going to get, uh, we're calling owner.getName, we're calling a method on a particular class, but if that class hasn't been set in car, we're going to get a null pointer exception. So in order to make that work, we need to inject the person into the car, and then we can call car drive and it'll all work nicely. But clearly, if we've got a thousand classes, let's say, this method of manual dependency injection is going to be, you know, hopeless. Um, we're going to get large numbers of null pointer exceptions. It's going to be complicated and messy. I'm very sensitive to small changes in the code, and there's no, even, not even any way of like automatically checking it if we wanted to check it. And at this point, uh, we enter Spring, which is going to solve this problem for us. So one of the core features of Spring is this uh, ability to inject dependencies, to manage the dependencies between Java beans um, in a sort of automatic or semi-automated way. And there's two ways you can do this. Um, the sort of the original way Spring used to do this is by having XML files that specified all the beans and all the relationships between the beans. Um, and more recently, um, they've added uh, the, the ability to do the dependency injection using Java annotations. So I'll show both of these to you, and you know. People who sort of Java architects and you know Java mega specialists, you know, sit around and you know on, a, on the long winter evenings discussing whether you know XML files or Java annotations are better. Right? There's the idea. There's a nice sort of simplicity in a way to having a separate way of specifying the dependencies from the actual code, which means you don't have to recompile the code every time you change the dependencies. Um, but on the other hand, Java annotations are actually a little bit easier to use, and it's kind of easier having all the the specification of the relationship between the beans sort of within the code. So it's you know, there's no right way um, of, of approaching this. In some cases, XML files will work well. Java annotations or maybe Java annotations will work well. But I bet you, um, in a lot of companies, they'll be still using the XML approach um, because, you know, they've had this code running for the last 10, 20 years or whatever, based on Spring. They're not going to switch over to Java annotations when the XML files are working perfectly well. So you specify the relationships between beans using either XML files or Java annotations. And then at runtime, Spring will wire up your application for you, and then you can just run the application. That's the idea. And as I said, it, it works well for complex Java applications. If I was writing a complex Java application now, I would, without hesitation, um, use Spring to connect up, the, connect up the different classes. Because, you know, when I haven't been able to use Spring, for example, in C++, you know, you can have sort of very long sort of sequence where you kind of create all the different classes manually and then you do all this setting and bloody blah to make them all work together. And it's a bit of a nightmare, yeah? So definitely Spring is a good solution for doing this in Java. So this is our XML conf configuration I'm going to cover first. It's the older sort of original method for wearing up beans, still no doubt very popular, um, still supported. Um, and you specify the beans and their properties and dependencies in XML file or several XML files. And then the spring will then wire up the beans at runtime. That's the idea. So just going to run through a little example XML file. So we covered XML in the sort of Maven lecture. If you've forgotten what XML is, maybe you want to go back and have a little look at that. 
So we've got all this sort of XML stuff, right? You know, the schema for violating the beans XML file, all this kind of stuff. So that's all good, but we don't have to worry about that. We can just kind of cut and paste that into our beans file. This is what the bit that we're actually going to be concern ourselves with. So each of these chunks of XML here is specifying um, a, a specific, uh, a, you know, an individual bean, okay? Now within this, each bean has an ID. So it's essential that each bean has a unique ID because that will enable us to inject one bean with a specific ID into another bean uh, and so we can, you know, handle the relationships between them, yeah? And then we specify the class of the bean, so that, that's obviously going to be used by Spring to create an instance of this class um, and it'll allocate this ID to it, yeah? So we've got the Spring Demo car, Spring Demo person here. Then we've got the sort of simple properties, you know, simple-ish, right? I mean, they might be based on some kind of built-in Java class, but they're not sort of, you know, they're not the classes we've created ourselves, yeah? Of course, we can inject Java classes just as well here. We could create class equals, you know, uh, you know, whatever, com.java, whatever the Java path is, all got Java, whatever. We could inject Java classes in here. I'm just in, happen to be injecting um, classes I've created myself. So here we have, um, and then we've got properties. So we've got, these are again, as I said, fairly simple properties. So the uh, person has like a name and an age, Tony and whatever. And what I'm doing here, I'm specifying values of these properties that will be, and then Spring will use the setter methods to set the color to red and set the manufacturer to Ford inside the my car class and set to the name to Tony and set the age to 31. Okay, so it's setting up the beans in the state we want to, them to start in. Yeah, that's what we're doing here. And then we got the dependency injection. So the third property of car is this car, car class. And what I've got here is a reference here to my person. And that's creating a link between this bean, this variable in this bean, and this bean here, yeah? So when I specify ref my person, I'm saying that this property here should contain this instance of this class here, yeah? So this class here is gonna be injected in here into the my car class here, yeah? So once we set up the bean file, which is nice and simple, you can even draw some nice diagrams in your beans if you like, um, then all we have to do is add the Spring libraries to your project. One approach, right? If you're using Spring and nothing else, maybe you want to do it this way. And I put the jar files online um, in case you want to do it this way. But, uh, but as I'll explain later, it's much, much easier using Spring with Maven because then it'll download everything you need and package it all up nicely. So I don't recommend this approach. Um, but if you're running Spring by itself or just want to play around with it, you know, then by all means just add the Spring libraries to your project. Then once you've done that, um, you can instruct Spring to create the beans from the XML file, access the bean class by D and call appropriate methods. So here we go. So it's kind of easy. We're just one line of code. We'll build our application from our beans XML file and you can, you know, add other XML files as well. And then we get, then uh, from the context, we can get the bean, right? We can get my car. The, the bean with ID my car, you know, out of that we cast it as a car class and then we get our car class and then we can call car drive. So it's wired everything up nicely. We just extract the bean we want and call whatever methods we want on it. Very, very nice, clean and easy. I, I like Spring, I have to say. Okay, so let's have a little demo. Right, so here's my Spring demo uh, uh, sort of net beans thingy, whatever. So here's my beans XML. This is so this is at the root. Let's just fish out the uh, let's fish out the the file structure for you. So Spring demo. So it's usually NetBeans thing. So we're going to source. I put beans XML at the root here of the source directory. And this just seemed to be easier, particularly when I was going to Maven and trying to package up resources. It seemed a little bit complicated. So I stuck it there. So also so I can see it within the um, uh, within the within the project kind of thing. If I hadn't put it there, it was, if I put it sort of somewhere else, in some other folder, it could be tricky to see in NetBeans. So for my ease of use, I stuck it in there. So here we've got our XML file. So we're thinking, so now I've wired up my beans nicely in my XML file. And then I've got, you know, here's my car, car class, a main class and the person class. Yes, yeah, so in the example code I've given you, I've got one, one example using the XML configuration, one example using the annotations configuration. Because this is just a demo, I've stuck all the Spring libraries just as libraries. You know, you just click, right click on library and do add jar file, right, or jar folder. So I've added them that way here. But I'll show you a little later how to add them with Maven. So we just run this, it's running XML one, right? So uh, here we go. So if you look at it, let's just stop it for a sec. So it's just gonna go on forever because it's a thread. So you see all this stuff where it's building the framework here. This is like info. And then it's all I'm asking it to do is within my car method, I've got this drive stuff, which is logging out. It's calling owner get name. 
and it's driving a car and blah, 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 yeah? So easy peasy. So in this case, uh, let's just go back to the output, which is now lost. Uh, let's just fix it so we don't lose it. So in this case, we've got Tony is driving a red Ford card along the road, okay? Um, and we've got Tony is driving a red Ford card because it's got owner get name, okay? And in the beans file, I've set my person name, sorry, the value, the property name has been set to Tony, right? So let's, this may not work, but if we set that to Julie, right? Let's just save it and run it again. And on a good day, yeah, there we go, it's worked, right? So in the beans file, I'm specifying that the my person class has the value, it sets name equal to whatever it's set here, yeah? So if I change that here, I'm getting a different um, name coming out here, yeah? Okay. So I said, uh, this Tony is coming from the person class that's been injected into the car class. So maybe this is just super obvious, but you know, hopefully it's clear. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I just explained there. Um, so that's the XML configuration. And as I said, it works nicely and some people prefer it over annotations, but other people prefer annotations, yeah? You're welcome to use either in your projects. So annotations are more modern in the sense that they've been added more recently. Um, and what you do uh, in the sort of very basic example of annotations I'm going to give you here is create a separate class that contains the annotations. And then we use two annotations. One is configuration, which marks that this class contains um, the sort of spring configuration stuff. And then each of the methods that creates a bean, um, we mark with the bean annotation. So these bean methods return beans, um, in which, and the name of the method is the ID of the bean, yeah? And then we can set the bean variables within the method that returns the bean. So it's almost identical to XML, except it's expressed within this Java class um, with the annotation stuff on top. So here's a little example. Um, so this is a, an annotation class, app config, okay? So then we need to say, at the top, this is a, the, use the annotation configuration. So then Spring will look at this class and use it to wire up the application, okay? And then we've got uh, methods in this class. Public methods, um, which are marked with the bean annotation. And what these methods do is return a class, an instance of a class, yeah? So this, this is returning a car class, this is returning a person class. And I can have multiple methods returning car classes, yeah? But they obviously are all gonna have different names. And this name here is the ID, corresponds to the ID of the bean in the XML file. So what this method will do, it'll return a car. If I wanna create a, a, class, a car class with sort of ID, my car, whatever, the ID is sort of conceptual rather than actually explicit here. Um, then I call my car and return a particular type of car, if you like, yeah? And then within each of these methods, we're doing the stuff that took place within each of the sort of beans uh, bits of bit of XML. So we're creating a new instance of the class, setting it up with a particular color, manufacturer, whatever we want. And then we're also doing the dependency injection here. You see, so it's kind of conceptually the same. So my person, I want to put a my person inside the car. So I'm calling set owner. And my person is then calling this method here, which sets up the person in the appropriate way. In this case, person whose age is 31, whose name is Tony. So it's doing, um, so yeah, that's the dependency injection there. So it's doing exactly the same as this, but it's expressing it in, in this sort of standard Java code, but combined with this annotation stuff so that Spring understands what, it, what it's doing. And annotations are super easy to use. Um, all we do is change the first line of this. I think, yeah, we just call, you know, Build, we're basically constructing Spring to build the application based on this class, and we can add other classes as well. Um, and then do exactly the same thing. We can get the bean out of the app, out of the context, and then call methods on the bean. So works exactly the same way. It's just a slightly different way of um, specifying the connection between beans and the properties of the beans. There's lots of other annotations like auto wire and so on and so forth. I haven't. I'm not going to give you the full tutorial on annotations. I'm just trying to show you, you know, how they, how it works at the most basic level. And in your projects, I'm only expecting you to get either the annotations work method working, wire up your project, or the XML version working. If you want to use uh, some of the stuff covered in the documentation to make your application better, you know, of course I encourage that. I'm just not going to cover it in great detail here. So, um, final part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about how you can use Spring together with Maven, because obviously that's a, a nice combination if we can use Maven to pull the dependencies, package up the XML stuff with the, into the jar file, then that's just, everything's gonna build nice and easily, yeah? 
So what we do is we, we just got to change our XML file, our POM XML, in a couple of places, and then it will nicely build our Spring application and package up the Spring jar files with it, as well as the Beans XML. So we need to specify um, in our POM XML that uh, we're using Spring and ask it to get the Spring dependencies from the repository. And we also need to tell it to put the, ex the appropriate configuration files into the resources section of the release um, if we're using the XML files. If we're not, then we don't need to bother them. So I've only tried it with the um, XML configuration, but I imagine it works just the same with the annotation stuff. So in, we, in the lecture uh, three or four, when it talks about Java, um, I gave you this kind of clock example. I think I showed you how to build that with Maven. So now I'm going to show you how you can rewrite um, the clock class as a bean. So I'm going to, I want to show you how to do it with the clock example. And to make the clock example work, um, I, need, I need my clock class and all my other classes to be beans, right? Otherwise I can't do the dependency injection and all that. So I need to get rid of, have a no argument constructor on my clock. And all of these are going to need no argument constructors as well. And I'm going to need getters and setters for all of my class variables. Um, so that I can, you know, so that so that Spring um, can inject an hours class into my hours, a minutes class into my minutes, and a seconds class into my seconds. So here's my Beans XML example for clock. Um, so as you can see, well, we'll ignore that. Um, we've got the one, two, three, four beans, and then these hours, minutes, and my seconds are all being injected um, into my clock because we've got this reference relationship between my hours here, my hours here, my minutes here, my hours here, my, hours here, my seconds there, and so on and so forth. And we're also setting up the hours, minutes, and seconds at particular values. We want the clock to be created in the state of 23, 59, 34, for example. And yeah, yeah, so that's injecting the hours, that's the hours being injected in the hours, minutes being injected in the minutes, seconds being injected into the seconds. <clears throat> now in our project, project object model, um, we need to specify that we're using the spring library, so all we have to do is bung in that bit of XML, and then it will automatically pull the, all the dependencies from the repository, super easy with Maven. And then in the resources section, um, we create a new resources section as part of the build, um, we add the bean. We want the beans XML to be copied into the jar file or into any releases, yeah, because the application won't run without that. So we're just saying that the directory source has this file beans XML that needs to be that needs to be included in the release um, as part of the packaging up into the jar file or whatever other release we choose to do. So to run it, it's, it works exactly the same way as I explained previously. We you know instruct Spring to build up the build wire up the application from the XML file here. And then we just get a clock bean out of the up, out of the context, and then it'll just run that method, you know, tick 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 tick, and output it to the command line. Now we are going to rewrite the tests as well um, because the tests were written with the assumption that we had, arg you know, a not we had a, an argument based constructor. So now we need to, and also, you know, the it was done in a. The first clock class that I showed you wasn't didn't have this sort of modular bean architecture. It had the sort of, uh, I think, I can't remember how it was. I think the clock created its own hours, minutes, and seconds, which, you know, isn't great, yeah? It's much better to do it this way. Now, probably, if I spent more time thinking about all this, I'd be able to figure out a way of uh, wiring up the test objects using Spring. I haven't bothered with that. I've just sort of manually set the hours, minutes, and seconds. I'm not saying this is a good approach, but in terms of, you know, all, the point I'm really trying to make is that you're going to have to rewrite your tests um, if you want to um, to make them fit in with this kind of framework. If, you, if you're changing everything into beans, obviously your tests are going to have to be changed as well, and that's, that's not a bad thing. So yeah, I think what I did here actually is I, before each, uh, I used the before each annotation here in JUnit, so before each, I just set up the clock into a new state, like a zero, zero, zero state or whatever. And then I could, um, then it'll, it'll initialize a clock in this for each method, in this before each method, and then test um, the clock that's initialized in this method. So I don't have to write this in every, every test because it's being set up for each test. Yeah, I've got a clock instance here that's being initialized in the before each method. So that clock has been set up uh, by there, and that'll be set up for each test independently. Okay, well, I'll do a little demo of Spring with Maven. Probably won't work, but let's give it a go. And so let's just uh, clear that. So I've set up all my um, paths here. I've set up Java Home and I've set up the path to Maven. Um, and here, if we go to my Maven demo, so I haven't given you this, but you know you can do it yourself. It's not hard. Um, so by the way, in the example code, it only contains the your first demo of the, the car and the person. I haven't bothered including the um, the latest stuff. So here's my POM XML for the Maven, 
And so I've added in my spring dependency here, and I've added in uh, blah, 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 resources into the build, so it'll copy beans XML into the directory. And then what we'll do, that's all we need to do, isn't it? And then it's just the standard stuff, the palm, we've got the source. Source contains beans XML as well as the main and test, as you expect. And if I run the thing, uh, Maven package, um, it'll build it if it needs building. In this case, it's already built. It'll run all the tests. That's what's so beautiful about Maven. Uh, and then it's built my release, uh, built my jar with dependencies. So if we have a little look at in the target um, folder, here's my jar with dependencies. So if you look inside the jar, uh, we can see we've got the beans XML has been nicely packaged up. Here's my classes here, the clock class, blah, 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 blah. And it's also packaged up all of the spring stuff. Yeah, so with some other bits and bobs, because they, you know, there's interdependencies there as well. So this is all the spring classes there too. So pretty nice, has to be said, and as well as the meta meta thingy, whatever, uh, where it's gone. Um, yeah, that contains the somewhere or the manifest, right, which specifies where the main method is. So that's all nice and easy, and then I package it all up, now I can actually run it using java.jar, that's the file that's just been built, the one I just showed you. If we run that, you can see it's running it a hundred times, and here's all the spring stuff showing you it's actually running on spring with the XML configuration stuff, and then it's running the clock and it's like going 0013, 0014, so on and so forth, so we've got a hundred ticks of the clock roughly. So as I mentioned at the beginning, Spring, you know, has the core functionality, which is super cool. Um, but there's also a lot of other modules within that Spring sort of has, a sort of semi-independent projects. So it's got like messaging stuff there, there's database functionalities, and like web services, all this kind of thing. Um, some of these might be useful to your projects, but talk to me if you are going to use them, because, you know, if you can use the database stuff, let's have a discussion about whether it's going to be better or worse than Hibernate. Or oh, it's got Spring Boot or Spring Android. So maybe even in your third year projects, you'll find some of this useful. So there's a little sort of summary of all the projects there. And so this is the Spring Framework. That's the core stuff I've been talking about here. But then you've got a bunch of cloud functionality, cloud data flow, Spring for Android, Webflow, web services, shell, session, you know, whatever. You, you know, lots of different, you know, useful stuff. So there's five marks for using Spring um, in Coursework One. Uh, so, you know, I'm expecting you to write a fairly complex Java app, not super complex, but you're going to have a number of classes in your Java application. I'm expecting you to use Spring to wire up these classes together, which obviously is going to help you if you apply for a job in Java, you know, because you can say, oh, well, you know, I built my, you know, did my coursework in, using Spring and wired up these classes and so on and so forth. You'll know what they're talking about, yeah, if they ask you about it in the job interview. So as usual, I've got my resources. So as I said, the Spring example code only has examples for the car and person stuff and showing you how to wire them using annotations or using uh, XML. Um, you know, I don't think you really need the Maven file or anything like that. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and then I have included in the software the Spring core jar files. So if you just want to get Spring running by itself just to test it out and see how it goes and wire up your application, then, you know, by all means, download those and use them or more recent versions if you like. I just put them there for convenience. Um, but I recommend, you know, when you come to your final project build, that you just use Maven um, to, to put it all together, because as, as you can see, right, the Maven stuff's, you know, pretty good. Right, so in this lecture, I've explained how you can use Spring uh, to wire up the dependencies of your application, and the next lecture is going to introduce you to Hibernate.